Would you take your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 2? Philippians chapter 2. I too this morning want to congratulate and also wish all the dads this morning and would be dads happy Father's Day. Um, there's nothing as a non dad I can practically advise to give you, but um, that I had been on the receiving end of fatherhood. I had two wonderful dads. My own dad who died 22 years ago and my father-in-law who died about two and a half years ago. They left such a, a, such a impact on my life in such a different ways. Um, and at the age of 53, I miss them more today than I did even a week ago. And so uh, we love you. We love the dads in here and, and keep, keep fighting and keep running the race. But we have one omnipresent father who never dies, who never leaves. He's always present, faithful, consistent, gentle, caring, loving, and good. And so to all the dads, look to him. Look to him. Now, as a non-father, I have made a certain observations. Um, it is amazing. Some of you dads, or most of you, from the years that they're toddlers to when you're helping them tie the knot, your joy and tears, uh, you're over-elated with them. And there's somewhere between teenage years to college tuitions, you're frowning. And so that is an observation as a non-father I've noticed. So let's work on that. Um, <laughs> this morning, I want to I wanna look at a life of a man. This is not just for fathers. This is for men throughout this body, um, whether you're young and you're old. This is a biographical passage in scriptures in Philippians chapter 2, verses 25 through 30. Um, I had a hard time deciding what to call this. I, I had this, this man I've come to love, Aphroditus. I've called it the sacred life. I've called it the ordained ordinary life. I've called it the radical ordinary life, so I went the Puritan way, and I'm calling this the sacred, ordained, radical of the ordinary life. <laughs> um, there, there is something, there's something about eulogies that I love more than resumes. Before you think I'm sick, um, Resumes talk about the externality of men. Resumes talk, speak often about achievements and accomplishments and accolades. They tend to be externals, where usually eulogies, you get a window to hear and see into the person's life and heart what they meant to others, their sacrifices, their love, their generosity, their steadfastness, their faithfulness in day-to-day -day life. The culmination of everyday life have made them these extraordinary, beautiful men. It is like building a brick building, being a mason and a son of a mason. You go to work day after day, Day after day, you're building the same brick day after day. And one day you're done, you step back and you look and you see the beauty and the grand of this building. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful. It doesn't just pop out of nowhere. It's the day after day faithfulness. Today, the idea of an ordinary life or ordinary people, or ordinary job, or ordinary work has fallen on hard grounds, where the ordinary is sort of despised or looked down upon, 
People speak of wanting epic lives. I want a radical life. I want my life to be full of adrenaline. I want, I want to do something awesome. I want jobs that have meaning. I want to change the world. We all want that. We all want that. There is a beauty and there in order, and there is a rhythm and rhyme in every day's life. And we'll see it here in this man. There's a song by Michael Card that I love listening to almost every six months. It's based on Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we could walk in them. And it is the whole idea is every life is a poem. Every life, ordinary life is a poem. We are, and he says, he says, we are living epistles. And so our lives are meant to be listened to because it is God who is speaking into and out of our lives. Through the parable of each day, the symphony of the years, and the masterpiece of a lifetime. And some of the lyrics go like this. Life is a song we must sing with our days, a poem with meaning more than words can say. God shapes every second of our little lives and minds every minute as the universe stands by the rhythm and the rhyme of your life. Ken was gutsy during Mother's Day to speak about election and I want to build on that and say if we if we have been chosen in him before the foundation of the world then certainly certainly he gave us as gifts to his son and he ordains and watches over every day of our life whether trials or triumphs he brings that and so today I want to look at the ordinary the ordinary ordained lives of our lives. Paul wrote to, to the Corinthian in 2 Corinthians 3, 2, he said, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. So I want us to meet this man this morning, Ephroditus. I have come to love this guy. Six verses. All we have is six verses about this man and his life. So let me pray for us and let's turn to our text this morning. Philippians chapter 2 verses 25. And let me, let me, let me ask God would, would liven, if you will, would liven this passage to our hearts. Father, we, we come and we say, would you please, would you please provide manna would you provide manna for us today through these six verses that father through a life of your saint who lived nearly 2,000 years ago would would preach would preach to our hearts such encouragements and lord that we would look beyond any man and look to christ the man and the God who had come to abide in us and with us. Thank you. Would you please have your way with us this morning, Lord? In Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Verse 25, chapter 2. But I thought it necessary to send to you Aphrodite, my fellow brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my needs, because he was longing for you and, all, and was distressed because you had heard he was sick, for indeed he was sick to the point of death. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow." Therefore, I have sent him all the more eagerly so that when you see him again, you might rejoice and I may be less concerned about you. Receive him in the Lord with all joy 
and hold men like him in high regard because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service. I want to back my way into this passage and then come forward. Um, The only command that we have in this passage for the Philippians and for us, it comes to us in verse 29 and says this, Receive him in the Lord with all joy and hold men like him in high regard or high honor. Receive and hold. Receive and hold men like him. And so the story behind the story, to kind of put it in its proper context, if you will, Paul having been arrested, thrown into a, into a Roman prison, which he would have been under house arrest. And in those times, the state did not provide for you. So family or friends would have to come and live with you and provide for you. And when the Philippians church, who had been supporting Paul's missionary journeys, had heard that Paul was in prison in Rome, their warm hearts were moved with such compassion, right to action. They could not all go to him, so they sent one of their delegates, one of the men, by the name of Aphroditus, to carry and to take gifts to him, and not only to take gifts to him, but also to be a gift to him during that time and during that season, to take care of him, to be his servant, to meet, to meet all his needs. So he was, you would say, he was a personal representative of the church to Paul. He would have been their mouth, their hands, and their feet. All was founded in this man. This is what we would call a modern day, a short mission trip to serve. It was the whole church's ministry. And he would have traveled from Philippi all the way down to Rome, 800 miles. If you draw a straight line from Denver right into L.A., that would have been that that would be 800 miles. And it would have taken him three to four weeks to get there. It was a risky trip. It was a risky stay. Besides the travel and the danger and the diseases, he would be associated with a man who is under capital charge and capital punishment. So for Aphrodite to go and to be with Paul and stay with Paul, he took these risks along the way. And so... Either somewhere along the way, during those three to four weeks, or when he got to Paul, he got sick so bad, he came close to death. He was, not only this, he was concerned or distressed. He was concerned that the Philippians had heard about this when he had gotten well that he wanted to get back and make sure they're fine. Paul is concerned about him, and Paul is concerned about the Philippians, that they were concerned about Aphrodite. So he said, I found it necessary to send him back to you. And just in case he shows up early to the church and they say, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? Aren't you supposed to be staying with Paul? He writes this wonderful Six verses about this brother. Saul, Paul is about to say and commend few things. So this morning, I want to look at these things. What he meant to Paul, what he meant to the church, and the command to them and to us what to do with such men. So there are eight characteristics I want to highlight for us with this man. The man, the brother, verse 25, the fellow worker, the fellow soldier, the messenger of the church, the minister of the church, the concerned brother, and the gambler. And the gambler. In verse 25, we are introduced to the man but I thought it necessary to send you Aphrodite. The name really, there's not a whole lot on that name except 
It means lovely or loveliness or charming or calmly. And boy, did this man live up to that name. He would have been given that name. He, he would have been a, a PK, a, 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 a pagan's kid, if you will. Not a pastor's kid, but a pagan's kid. And his parents being devoted to Aphrodite, they would have given, they would have honored their God with their son and his name. And so this is a, a pagan kid, grows up, becomes a Christian. It is a common name. We don't know anything about this man except in these six verses. He is not a pastor of the church. He's not an elder. He's not a deacon. He's not a seminary grad. We're told nothing about him, nothing about his gifts, nothing about his talents, nothing about his looks, nothing about his stature, nothing. Nothing we know about this man. He is the truest of an ordinary man that could be described. But somewhere along the line, he was well thought of by the Philippian church to trust him with the cash, to trust him with the money, and to send him to Paul and to minister to Paul in confinement. So what did he mean to Paul? In verse 25, if you look with me, he describes, he's described by Paul in three ways. These are like epitaphs. Paul speaks in this glowing terms. He sort of lights up when he starts speaking about Aphrodite. And he, he speaks about him in symphony. He speaks in sympathy, in labor, in danger. He says, but I thought it necessary to send you Aphrodite. And he begins with this phrase, my brother. My brother. The ramification of that phrase is huge. If we met Paul, who was Saul, a Hebrew of Hebrews, a Jew, a lover of the law of the strictest kind, he would have looked at someone like Aphrodite and he would have said, a, a pagan dog. And yet he sends this man, he says, my brother. They would have been complete Enemies, complete enemies on the opposite side of each other. Reminds me of a story I, I, I heard from Brother Andrew about 30 years ago. Brother Andrew went to Israel and he took members of the Palestinian church and he took members of the Jewish believing church and he took them out to the desert and they held the first communion service they ever had together. And it was the blood of Christ that tore the animosity down, the prejudice between each other. They would have been complete, complete enemies. There is no way a Jewish Pharisee would have called a pagan kid my brother. Nick Ripken from Kentucky told the story. He went to Somaliland to serve as a relief worker and a missionary after the Civil War. His family would stay in Nairobi and he would fly weekly in and out of Somaliland. Four weeks before he was kicked out, on Easter morning, his 16-year-old son, Timmy, died from an asthma attack. He called his assistant back in Somaliland and said, Hussein, I can't come. Timmy died. And phone went blank just as of it was dropped. Hussein started walking through the, through the desert, through landmines, on camelbacks, on trucks, showed up five days later in Nairobi, dehydrated, cracked, and blue lips. Knocked on the door, and he said, I am here to bury our son, Timmy. That's, that's, that's behind when he says, my brother, I'm sending you my brother. This is not some modern day cheap 
imitation. Hey, bro, you're, we're all brothers. All, none of that. There's nothing shallow. There is a sense of brotherhood. There is a sense of endearment. There is a sense of closeness. There is, there is depth in this. I am sending you my brother. I'm sending you my brother. So, way of application for us this morning. I personally, I have been so spoiled here at Southside. I have so many of these men around me. And my question to the rest of the men here, do you have men like that around you? Are you a man like that to others? Are you an Aphroditus to others? Are you a brother? Are you a brother? Is there that close relationship? He says, not only am I sending you my brother, he says, I'm sending you my fellow worker. He does not say co-worker, my fellow worker, one in labor, united in work, fellowship, laboring together. The phrase is, is it, the, the idea is a kingdom laborer, a kingdom worker, a man who labored alongside Paul, hand in hand. Paul doesn't look down on him. And the question you, 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 you might have to ask, and I don't want to read too much into the text, what would have, what would have Aphrodite done? And chances are every morning he got up, he spent time in prayer with Paul. He went to the farmer's market, picked the latest, freshest vegetables, tomatoes and cucumbers, brought them back, cut vegetables out, cooked for Paul, cooked for himself, made tea for visitors, cleaned the floor, wiped things down, got things ready. That's ordinary life. There's no glamour in all this. Everyday life. And Paul says he's my co, my fellow worker, my fellow worker. He might have sat down and related stories how God caused a prison break in his hometown. He might have talked about a conversion of a Philippian jailer. So he's not just a companion. He's not just a brother. But he says, my fellow worker. My fellow worker. Third thing we see here is he says he's my fellow soldier. Not just a companion, not just a laborer, but a, a companion in arms. There was this solidarity among believers. A feeling of unity between men who have the same interest goals when it comes to spiritual things. He's my fellow soldier, my fellow soldier, not just worker, spiritually minded men, an enlisted man who is not spiritually entangled with this world, but he's a soldier from day one at the workplace, at the park, at home, with the kids, wherever. He's a soldier. He is a soldier. We never stop being soldiers. There is no part-time enlistment in this. For me, being a soldier, whether, whether Robert and I walking into a Muslim's home to, to lay hands and cast demons out, or whether flipping through the channel, what movie can I see and not watch? It's not right for me to watch, to to getting on my knees and praying in the morning, that's, that's, you never stop being a soldier. You never stop being a soldier. We're soldiers for life. And so when he says, my brother and my fellow worker and my fellow soldier, they were together in, in faith, they were together in blood, they were together in arms, and they battled back to back, whatever came on. I love this. I love this. this. This man meant so much to Paul. When everybody went home, when everybody went to their family, and Paul was left alone in no cell or in that home confinement, there was this brother next to him. And that's why he can say, my fellow soldier. The phrase fellow is so rich. One commentator says this. 
He said, had he been a quarrelsome, nagging, restless person, ready to pick out faults and, and quick, to, quick to criticize, he might have still be called a worker and a soldier, but not have been graced with the title by Paul, fellow, a comrade, a fellow in toil, a fellow in labor, a fellow in danger, a commonality, one together. And so this is what he meant. This is what he meant for Paul. And right adjacent to that, right in the text, he says, these three nouns, they're adjacent to what he meant to the church. Look with me. Look with me to verse 25. He says, my brother, my fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is your messenger and minister to my need. Who is your messenger and minister? The word messenger, we get the word apostolos, to be an apostle, but this isn't in the formal kind. This is not in the 12 apostles type. He is a general sent one. He is not an apostle of Jesus Christ. He is an apostle of the church. He had been commissioned and sent by the church. Unlike the 12, he is a sent one. He would have been sent by the church as a delegate by the body to carry out an assignment. He is your messenger. He is your messenger in the body, one of the body, acting as though in the whole body is acting is in one man. So unlike today, you hear this phrase, my ministry, my calling, my gifts. He says, he is my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow and he, soldier, and he is your messenger. He is your messenger. No one is alone. No one is on an island alone. Your minister, second thing he says here, and your minister to my needs. Lutugos, the word, we get the word liturgical. What he, the way he ministered, Paul uses a word that is used for angels who serve God. He uses a word who, of, used of priests who serve in the temple. And he says, all the service that he met me with and he met my needs were like sacrifices unto God. They were sacred. He brought in such dignity to this man's average every day's work. And he said, he is your servant. Whether, again, whether he cleaned the floor or whether he wiped the bathrooms down, he said, he was, his service to me was sacred, sacred. Same idea, chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. I am, I am amply supplied, fully made full, having received from Aphrodite what you have sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. Your minister, this, your minister to my need. And other thing we see about him, seventh, is because he was longing. He's such a sensitive man. You pick this out, out of this passage. He's such a sensitive man because he was, verse 26, he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard and he was sick. Not only did he miss the local body, not only did he miss his brothers and sisters in the faith, he was so troubled that they heard he was sick and even to the point of death. So he was concerned about the church being concerned about him. He's not one of those self-sensitive people, men. He is other sensitive. One of the beautiful characteristics about this man is he's tender, tender about others. He did not want with his troubles to weigh down the church in any way. Verse 27, Paul says, For indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, 
and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I have, not, I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again, you might rejoice, and I may be less concerned about you. Paul, being selfish, could have used Ephroditus. He sent Ephroditus back to Philippi. So, what he meant to Paul, what he meant to the church, Third question is, how, how should we treat men like him? How should we treat men like him? The command here in verse 29, Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard. So he, the idea of these two commands, receive and hold. Receive and hold. Men, honor men like him. Love them, encourage them. Always receiving them with joy in the Lord. So the first application, he says, he says, honor men like him. Honor the ordinary men like him. Because when, when Paul says he's my brother and he says my fellow soldier and my fellow worker, these are emblems of honor. Not the gifts not the popularity, not the talents, not the stature, not the education. But a brother, a worker, and a soldier who happens to be the sent one. And who happens to be the sacred service-oriented person. It takes faithfulness. Faithfulness in the little things and in the big things. It takes character with these men. It takes consistent, steady, zeal, passion, sacrifices. Let me go negative on us for a minute. Let me go negative. Don't glamorize ministries and don't glamorize ministers. Be careful of the super apostle syndrome and the personality cult. Don't look at, not, ev not everybody is a MacArthur and a Piper and a Keller and a Sproul. Not everybody's that way. Love them for who they are, but love the ordinary. Love the ordinary. Love the men and the women that are in here day in and day out. They are ministering. Some of the most faithful churches around the world, some of the hardest working churches around the world are a hundred members or less. So don't glamorize ministries, mega churches, super apostles. There are men this morning here. They've opened the building and they've locked, they will wait till everyone leave and lock the building from the hospitality team who greet us with a smile, to those who work the AVL, to the security team who make sure we're safe, to the teachers every Sunday morning, week in, week out, make sh to those who watch after the building and make sure in a, in a rainstorm, this roof and this ceiling is not leaking on us. Those who come on Wednesdays and Thursdays and practice that we can have music. Got to read. I got to read something beautiful because for you doing that day to day, I want to give you a little Jonathan Edwards. And this belongs to you guys. Two things urgently needed in ministers if they would attempt great advances for the kingdom of Christ, our zeal and resolve, their influence and power for impact are greater than we think. A man, listen to this, a man of ordinary abilities will accomplish more with zeal and resolve than a man ten times more gifted. Without zeal and resolve, Men who are possessed by these qualities commonly carry the day in almost all affairs. They care. Did you hear that? They carry the day. Steady, faithful, 
zeal, passion for Christ and his people. Living every single day. <clears throat> Last May, I sat at a table between a husband and a wife. Um, the guy, I think, was like this tall. And, and I said, talk to me. What are you doing? He said, I ran covert operation in Syria. I said, like what? He said, I go and I minister, including Aleppo. He said, I minister to churches in torn down buildings. We bring Bibles, we bring the gospel, we bring message. We bring communion elements to them and help them out. I said, where do you live? He said, Michigan, suburbia. I said, wow, that's great. I turned over to his wife and I said, are you scared for him? She said, I'm sort of stuck with a 17 year old. If, if he's gone, I would be right there with my husband. I said, wow, amazing. Average, ordinary people. Average, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Whether across the continent or right here in Colorado, they, you carry the day. You carry the day. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. God looks down. God looks down on men like that. And he says, like Job, he says, that's my son. That's my son. And Christ looks down and says, that's my brother. And they look like me. That's what's important. Second application. It says, receive him with all joy and hold men like him in high honor, regard or esteem. Extend to him, extend to him the most joyful welcome in the Lord. And here's the reason, verse 30, this, this, yesterday I got to the heart of this passage and it, and it, and it checked my heart so bad, I was left raw with it. We got to read it slow. We got to read it slow because the ramification of this passage is huge. <clears throat> because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient la or lacking in your service to me. So in one way, here's what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, all your favors shown to me are deeply appreciated. And if there were anything lacking in your kindness to me, you have certainly made up for it by sending Aphroditus. But it's not only because he risked his life that he... It, it, it's, it's he came close in this service, literally the Greek word, he neighbored, he was neighbors. The Greek word is neighbors with death. He neighbored death to complete what is lacking in you to me. This is, he came near to death, not because of martyrdom, not because he was told to deny Christ. He came near to death to minister to a brother on behalf of a body, on behalf of others. He counted the cost, and we, this is where we get the idea, gambler. He, the Greek word is he risked, he gambled, he counted the cost. There is a cost to serving Christ, risking his life to complete and finishing up your service to me. He took a calculated risk. And here's the point. He chose against himself for someone else. Wow. What a way to view ministry. What a way. What is this going to cost me? How committed am I? Do I have to show up on time and all these things? I don't, I don't want to take cheap shots. But the cost, the integrity of saying, I will serve the Lord within the body. It's so, so beautiful. He took a calculated risk. He gambled 
risking his life. And you might want to ask the question, where did he get this? Where did he get this? Was it in Timothy? Certainly. Was it modeled in Paul? For sure. You don't have to look far till you get to Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Turn, turn with me there for a minute. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. Do not look, do not look merely. Don't look out merely for your own personal interest. He's writing to Christians. Don't, within the body, don't make life and ministry and your calling about yourself. Don't, don't try to affirm yourself and five, find identity in that. Don't do that. Don't look at people and wonder, am I important? Are people coming to me and asking questions? Am I needed? Don't find identity in ministry. Don't look out for your own interest. Enough of yourself. Be done. Be done. If you can't die to yourself, you won't die for Christ. You won't die for his people. He says, do not look out for your own personal interest, but also for the interests of others. Have this mind, have this attitude in yourself, which also is in Christ, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, utilized, asserted. Mine, give me, give me, at all the right. Yeah, at all the right. He who was the epic of life put, laid it aside by veiling himself. This was not a subtraction. This was an addition to his nature who existed in form of God to con weaknesses, to con humanity, to con veilness, this flesh and blood and, and, and brought dignity into man and brought dignity to our relationships and brought dignity to our work and our roles in life. That's what he did. And that's where Aphrodite learned this from. 33 years lived in the ordinary life. Don't look out for yourself. Aphrodite got it and modeled it, modeled his master, who is ready and willing. So Paul says, like Philippians 2 earlier, he says, honor and esteem these men. Give honor where honor is due. Receive and hold them. Hold them up. Love these men. I'm trying to say it. Men and women, trying to make this for men who serve in the ordinary everyday life, who lay their lives down on the line. C.S. Lewis said one time, and I'm going to paraphrase this, and I, this, this checked me. He said, help me to die before I get old. Help me to die Help me to die before I get old. And what he's talking about, death to self. To be done with self. Let me die before my death as men and as fathers. Something of divine splendor is reflected in our earthly relationship. We should recognize and we should honor, Bonhoeffer said. Don't belittle your role. Don't belittle your calling as fathers, as men, as ministers. Ecclesiastes 3.11, God has made everything beautiful in its time. Chesterton said, the most ordinary thing in the world is an ordinary man and his ordinary wife and their ordinary children. Let's rejoice 
in that. Let's rejoice in that. And let's model him who came not to be served, but to serve. And doing that, it cost him his life. And Ephrodite went to not be served, but served. And it almost cost him his life. They are beautiful, beautiful models in our life. Let's pray. Father, we, we thank you. We thank you. Father, make lively this. Make this. I pray for my brothers. They would never stop being brothers to one another. Would you please, Lord, press it. Press it on our hearts. I pray for my brothers that they would be kingdom workers. Enough, Lord, for us to, to piddle with this world. Father, I pray for my brothers to be soldiers who are enlisted and they don't forget. They live for that. And I pray for my brothers that they would remember, whether in work, whether at home, whether with the family, whatever they do, they do for the glory and for the honor of Christ and not their own. Father, grant your spirit to make us alive, alive to you. I thank you. I thank you for the examples that are before me here this morning. I thank you for the dads. May we be loved by them. May their life be a sweet aroma. Lord, you have taught us. You have taught us how to be sons by making us sons. Thank you. In Christ's name, amen.